Welcome back to another episode of Once a Warrior. My name is Monty Beetham and my guest tonight, well, he played 84 times for the Warriors. He debuted in 2009 and in that 2011 year, he found himself as a starting centre in the grand final. What a player he is. Lewis Brown, thanks for joining me, my man. Thanks, Monty, for having me. Um, I've been told about this programme, currently living over in Australia. So, uh, yeah, really, really was hanging out the bit to get, get on here and have a chat to you and... Uh, yeah, it's just been really cool to see uh, the players in, in, from different eras hop on and get to know them and see what they're doing now. So very proud uh, and privileged to be on the show with you. Awesome, brother. Uh, so are you still a fashion guru? And which part of Australia do you find yourself in? Just uh, update everyone at home, please, because they're interested to know. <laughs> uh, bro, I wouldn't say I'm a fashion guru. Uh, streetwear, streetwear guru trying to get into the fashion game. Uh, we're slowly getting there, so still still running Earl's Collection. Um, currently we're residing in Sydney, um, just moved over to the, the eastern suburbs, Bronte, so just down the road from the SCG and the new footy stadium that they're building. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go out last week, uh, took my two little nephews out to the uh, Warriors Sydney Roosters game. So that was the first time actually being a, um, not a part of rugby league, just sit in the, in the stands as a fan um, since I've actually uh, retired or even I guess um, you know since I started playing professionally it was a bit different but it was a great experience. Let's go back and refresh the memories out there in terms of what Louis Brown did in this great jumper that is the Warriors. Bang! Get out of my way this is Lewis Brown. Lewis Brown the shark! The shark is through! The shark is through! himself to a try. Here's Brown, cutting loose, goes straight through, shot the game. Lewis Brown bounce one off. The Lewis Brown, the punch his way through the line. When you see that, man, uh, plenty of tries, very strong running. Uh, you know, you were the man doing the thing in the jumper, man. What sort of memories does it provoke? Just putting on the jumper and becoming Warrior 151, actually getting my, my number um, was a really, really special time for me. And then probably um, my next one would be my first try. Um, I was playing back row that day. I was out at Shark Park. Um, and the person who actually gave the ball to me was my childhood hero, put me through a hole, Stacey Jones. I really just think running out of the tunnel there eh, was, was one thing for me I really just loved. Even though we had to run about 10k just to get down the other end of the field. Um, then nothing, nothing beats a beats, uh, Sunday afternoon game at Mount, Mount Smart. Eh? Nothing beats it. Um, you know, you, it's a full house and, you, and you're in good form uh, as a team. You know, the, 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 you know, the days where we were playing good, it was packed. You were running out. You were running out in front of you know twenty two thousand people, people up on the hill. Um, that's the days that I used to used to love love playing. You know, every time I got to play at Mount Smart, I used to love it. When the name the Warriors came up for me uh, to join the club at a very uh, small deal, um, I, I grabbed it with both opportunity. I got to come home. I was closer to my family down in Christchurch, and it was just good to be back in the New Zealand pathway system, the New Zealand system of rugby league, which I'd left at the age of 17 to go over to Sydney. Um, and then I, I spent five seasons at the Warriors. And, you know, for me to pull on to pull on that jersey each week, I remember when Rubes was my our trainer, he'd always grab me and say, don't don't let anyone take this jersey off you today. You, you make sure you're in this jersey next week as well. And that's something that always stuck with me. Uh, but it's memories that I always hold on forever. And out of the three clubs that I got to represent, the Warriors will always be home for me. That contract that you signed, mate, uh, and in hindsight, you think um, it wasn't all about merit that got you over here. You reckon you're on someone's coattails a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'll be brutally honest. Um, I, I dare say it was a favour of Ivan's um, to do for my management club, my agent. Um, he'd, he'd only seen a DVD of me, and at the time, I was playing for the Balmain Tigers in reserve grade, um, running that hooker at 108 kilos. You know, for me, I, I kind of knew it was the last roll of the dice. I knew it was the roll of the, like the dice of my professional career. Um, I came over um, 2000 and, into 2008 with a Liz Frank injury, weighing 108 kilos. Um, I just needed to lose some weight. I got him working with um, our old Warriors physio, Jude. 
um, and just really, really started learning how to walk again, run again. Mm. And then before the end of preseason, I found myself down at 96 kilos. So shredded, shredded off 12 kilos and then found myself at the best version of myself, ready to attack a, a full season and a full-time contract with the Warriors. And, and the boys were so welcoming and made you feel part of it. There was no one bigger than anyone else. Um, everyone in the room was equal. Um, Ivan made sure he drove that throughout the culture of the club. And I think for so someone like me who who was on an outside deal, not inside, not inside the top 25 back then, um, you can feel like you're on eggshells. But I, I tell you what, they've made me feel so much more welcoming and, and, and confident that I can actually play NRL. I think it was even Jude Spears at the time said to you, look, you... You need to, to show these boys what you can do because you spent the whole off-season losing some weight. There was a couple of trials coming up. You missed the first trial. Uh, so what, Jude had a word to you, I believe? Yeah, it, um, the, a couple of days before the first trial, um, we were down at Ellerslie Eagles because we used to train back there uh, then during the week. And um, Ian Henderson, bonky. Um, he liked, everyone knows he likes to do a, things 110%, mm. whether it's training or the game. He just come flying out and uh, broke my hand. So I missed that trial uh, and I was gutted. I remember um, picking up the phone to my mum and I was just like really upset. I was like, flip up. I don't even know if I'm ever going to see NRL. You know what I mean? I've just mm. not, nothing's going right for me. Um, I was meant to miss three weeks, but missed that only trial. And I decided to, um, the next week that we we're playing against uh, the Cowboys and decided to go to the specialist, um, make up a, a um, hand, um, hand guard, um, taped it up. It was still broken. And I remember my first um, first drill we did uh, was a pass from dummy half to Steve Price. And I'd never played with a guard in my hand. And I went to go throw the ball and I threw it straight up in the air, up in front of me and I caught it myself. <laughs> and um, man, I was so embarrassed there. Eh? And I was like, oh my God, I'm sure Steve Price was like, man, where did we I was only to an origin from, player, man? to an Australian player uh, and, and, and the captain yeah. at the time, Steve Price, mate. So you must have felt really good about yourself. Yeah, I felt great. I was silent the whole time. Um, it stayed in my mind the whole time. Um, and then leading up to the trial, I, I played 10 minutes at hooker. And then at half time, um, Ivan said to me, uh, have you ever played in the back row? And I said, never. Um, and he goes, well, right, you're going to jump on the left edge. Um, and I scored a double. And that's how the story of um, me becoming a second roller happened um, in the space of basically 20 minutes. Um, went from a hooker to a, uh, a back rower. And that's how the course of me in that position started to mold, uh, got in the gym, you know, my, my whole program completely changed. Now I had to find myself, you know, like specialising these skills, you know, I had to learn how to edge defence, which was so, so uh, different to a, a Dean in the middle, had to talk more, had to leave my edge. And I had to be that figure on the edge that led the line speed. And I also had to be a, a, like physical. And at that time I was quite small for a back rower, but I had leg drive and I was a bit of a, a bit of a little pit bull, um, but it took a, it took a while to get him used to uh, playing back row. But you know, people around me were helping me. Simon Manning was a massive help. Michael Luck, and you know, also Ivan. He was a big credit to them. We also had Big David Fairley, who was who was part of our coaching staff back then, too, and John Acklin, who were, were helping me also mould into a back rower. Um, but it wasn't easy. Um, and then slowly, as you do as a back rower, you get pushed out into the centres. And that's eventually what happened. Um, so I found myself between centre and, and, and back row most of the rest of my career at the Warriors. Uh, where did that mindset come from, that tenacity to, to do whatever it takes to be a part of uh, this wheel, uh, an important cog in this wheel? Yeah, I, I just knew that, you know, if you were going to play NRL, um, you, had to, you had to play through adversity. Um, you know, adversity comes in, in different ways, you know. Um, stuff happens during the week, you know, injuries. Um, and, and I knew that, this was my last chance. I, I just had to give it a go. And, you know, I think it probably showed to the, the coaching staff too that I was willing to play in, through an injury to, to live my dream, to do my job for the team. And you come into your shell a lot more. Players start to realise what you can do, what your what your talents are, what you need to work on. And, 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 and yeah, I just think it like gave me so much more confidence to, to that I could be an NRL player. Mm. Part of the coaching staff then, you've mentioned his name a couple of times, Ivan, and I know there was uh, a time in particular in one of the games where uh, he gave you a bit of a talking to. Uh, your nickname is Sharky. Why is it Sharky? And, and, and talk us through that game. Touch was my big sport as a kid, um, that in rugby league, and my local team um, was called the Sharks. Um, played the Penrith Panthers, called um, the Sharks, and um, 
anyway, um, we were up by quite a bit and we got mowed down and it went to extra time. And on an extra time, I come off with cramp. And, you know, at, at a young age, you, you know, you kind of judge yourself on on tries you scored, not not the effort areas, um, because that, that's, that's all part of learning and maturing as a player. And I had a big smile on my face, travel back to Auckland thinking, you know, I had a great game, which I probably had, but, you know, that wasn't what Ivan was looking at. He was looking at people wanting wanting to put their hand up for the team for the full 80 minutes plus the extra time. And, you know, he wrote, we used to, back in the day, you used to get a review sheet and I come in on Monday and I was like, oh, this is going to be good, good, good review. And all he wrote was, um, all he wrote was, uh, learn to push through fatigue, not choreograph try celebrations. Mm. And that's something that stuck with me forever because um, I knew that um, I, I learned something from that, actually. I knew that it wasn't always about tries. It was always about the team to Ivan, and that's what the culture he was building. And, and um, that really helped with me. It stuck with me. That, that culture you mentioned in 2011 in particular uh, was a special one. If you could bottle it up, what, 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 what do you think it was? I mean... A uh, great team, uh, a team that was so close uh, to winning the grand final, lifting that trophy for the first time in the club's history. I just think we had a great pathway. We had a great great bunch of blokes. We had, um, you know, we, we were very fortunate at the Warriors. Um, we, we, we like to call it fortunate back then because we got to travel to Australia every second week with our, our best mates. Um, and... You know, you, you bond over that. Um, you get to see people outside of their comfort zone um, and you get to know people better. Back then, there was no social media. Um, there was no PlayStation 5s. So all you had to, all you could do was get to know each other, go for coffees. You know, uh, we we're fortunate enough to start Coogee, Coogee Bay Crown Plaza a lot. Um, so the boys would always be down part of the Sydney Coffee Group and Michael Luck and Simon Manor in leading that, Ian Henderson playing cards, you know, the old school way. Um, and we just got to know each other and we just had a great group of people we're building, we keep building. And then unfortunately, um, you know, we lost that grand final and we probably played our grand final the week before against Melbourne down there. Nobody gave us an absolute chance. Nobody even thought that we were going to beat them down there. If I was to ever say, it, what was your perfect game that you played in? What was the one that went to script? Um, I'd have to say that, that, that 2011 Premier Final down in uh, down in Melbourne definitely was the perfect game I've ever been a part of. A lot of us thought we'd probably go back to a grand final, um, but we never did. I remember Owen Goonville coming in and Logan Swan during the weekend and just telling us, take your time out there because the grand final happened so fast. And, you know, I look back now and and, and it did. It, it was, mm. I remember Sponge, Tony, Tony Ira at the time, saying to us, run out uh, and make sure you look back at your family. Uh, we ran out to a a mass, a mass crowd doing the haka for us. And it was just emotions were high. Um, and, you know, just the day was, you know, we were an hour late to the game because the bus driver took the wrong route. I look back and I probably regret um, not taking it all in. It's a big week, you know, um, you know, get, getting up for, you know, the breakfast, you know, all the promotions. Um, but just small things like that, it was just all a blur. And then before you know it, it's over. And... Yeah. You know, at, at that age, I think I was 25, 24, and I was like, oh, you know, I've still got a long, long time. I'm, I'll, I'll find myself back here again, but never did. And it, it's so true. You you just got to live in the moment. In, and that's why I say to people, you know, make the most of it now because before before you know it, it's over. It really mm. is. Like my 10 years in the NRL went so fast. Yeah, when you're thinking about a half pairing, that's probably one of the perfect half pairings as well. Um, Sean Johnson in his debut year, um, an exciting player, but James Maloney, what made him an absolute winner? He had confidence in, in, in his ability, uh, but just an absolute competitor. He had the loudest mouth, whether it was on the field or off the field. Um, and, and that's why he had so much success, because he he spoke up when needed to be. He's a, he's a, he's a born leader, and um, that year he was massive for Sean. Um, he allowed a Sean... To just play off the cuff, play his, play his natural game. Um, and Jimmy just steered the ship around. Um, and once again, to think that he went on after that grand final to play with the Roosters and Cronulla in grand finals just shows what type of player that we had at the Warriors that had once again had come to the Warriors, had bounced around from club to club and then just found himself at the Warriors but found his feet and found his his capabilities, found his confidence and and, and that's what, at that time, in that era, 
we were in. That's what Ivan was doing at that club was, you know, uh, allowing people to come in and, and building that culture and believing in you. Uh, and, and when someone believes in you, you believe in them. We just had the right ingredients. And then I was just unfortunate that it had to come to, a, to an end in 2012 you know, that, that mixture of people. What about off the field, man? Uh, the, the things that um, you've got fond memories of in the Warriors' colours or through that area while you're at the club? Yeah, I just remember just, like, I'd never, like, tried a coffee in my life, to be honest with you, Monts, and um, they had a massive coffee crew um, at the Warriors. A lot of pranks um, going on. I remember uh, even our trainer, Craig Walker, um, got uh, Ian Henderson a beauty one day. Uh, I think Hendo had done something to Walks, and uh, Walk snuck up and, and changed his phone number and Ian Henderson's phone to Wayne Scar as the CEO at the time <laughs> and actually text Bonky and said to him, hey, mate, can you please come in on Monday? We want to talk to you about um, a contract uh, renewal. <laughs> and um, Bonky's actually gone to um, Wayne's office and, um, <laughs> you know, um, and Wayne's like, what are you talking about, mate? Uh, we have no offer for you. So <laughs> you can imagine um, how bad the pranks were back then. Even like Kevin Locke, when he came into the the, the grade, um, he thought he was quite a prankster. So one day he taped all of my shoes together. And um, back then um, we used to get interns in to kind of do the, the the protein shakes after the game. And that's when the, the science of the sport was evolving and, mm. you know, BCAAs and, you know, the amino acids were a big thing after training. And um, they used to, I don't know if you remember, they used to give you the tingles um and nobby nobby typed taped all my shoes up so i got him there first and i i chucked in uh, about four more scoops than he should have and he ended up giving doc mayhew a call and saying mate i'm on the, i'm on the harbour bridge and i'm and i'm shaking what should i do i'm sweating um but that just taught him um just pranks like that they were the great days off the field and then there were the days where um you know i was into my fashion back then and i'd rock up rock up to you know, functions and I'd be wearing a cardigan and Ivan would come up to me and be like, Sharky, what are you wearing, mate? What's that cardigan about? And um, I actually got a text from him after we won the grand final. I, I, I congratulated him and he's like, oh, it looks like all that weird, those weird outfits you used to wear back in there has come, come, come around full circle and working for you now. So yeah. it, it's funny how things work in different ways. Mate, just, just just on that, who's in your phone from the old days, whether it be the 2011 team or the days in the Warriors that you talk to quite often? Um, Shawnee, I, I, I reach out to him quite a bit. Uh, even Lance, we, we, we chat quite a lot, um, even though he's over in Michigan doing his rugby thing. But he was someone that I could chat to um, because he found himself in the u- utility spot a lot. And it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a weird position, the utility spot. But it's, it's quite a hard one to get around mentally. And, and it's scary. And, you know, he had walked the same textbook before me where his, he was the utility and then... I was all, all of a sudden the 14 or, or someone who's getting shoved out in the centres. But he was someone I really lent on and I still talk to today. And, you know, you see see, see some boys and you, and, you, and you think you're knowing them, but then you think, geez, I, I never really thought they would go into this this direction when they retire. But the kind of the most feedback I get is, you know, it was it was just, it was for you, this this industry I'm in now, um, the fashion game or the streetwear game, everyone was like, we could tell you it, it lined up for you. It was something that you wanted to do. Um, and and I, I take a lot of things from what I learned from the Warriors and in rugby league um, to business. And there's a lot of things that you can you can take. And, and one of them is definitely um, culture. Um, culture is something that my most successful teams in my career have never been the most superstars but they've always had the best mm. culture and you've always had the best fun you 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 can tell when a team's having fun look at the Penrith Panthers at the moment they're not arrogant they're just enjoying their time and 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 there's nothing that you'd know yourself Mont, but there's nothing better when you're in that zone yeah absolutely brother uh Louis once a warrior always a warrior thank you for your time and the jump and what you've been able to do there are many people that you please and uh you know it's great to see you doing very well in your service man in terms of uh, your fashion no, I appreciate you, Monson. and I, I um, appreciate being on the show, um, you know, to be part of uh, Warriors history, just even if it's a little bit, um, you know, that's my dream I've lived. And, you know, you know, War- uh, Auckland and, you know, Mount Smart will always be home to me, um, no matter what. From one fan favourite to another, coming up on Once a Warrior next week, it is the man affectionately known as Friendy, Nathan Friend, that hooker who did the flip. Catch us same time, same place next week. 
going to Lewis Brown. He's having a real dig, isn't he? He's still going, this Cantabrian. My goodness, he's strong. Over the top to Lewis Brown. Wow. Charging onto it is Lewis Brown once again. Brown, nice step, good footwork. Great footwork, and he's gone through. For Lewis Brown to punch his way through the line. Lewis Brown gets himself a double. This Brown down the side.